Okay, greetings everyone, and uh, thank you for attending Ukraine's Horizons. I'm gonna stand up. They always, I'm a professor, they tell us we should stand up. I'm gonna stand up for one minute. Um, we, we, are, we are at a very interesting moment where on the one side, we have to think about a military victory in Ukraine, and at the same time, we have to think about the European Union membership of Ukraine. The concept which unites, I think, victory and membership is reconstruction. Uh, we are thinking about horizons seriously, horizons political, economic, and military. And I thought the way to begin this discussion about horizons would be to ask each of our valuable participants briefly to speak about what we learned or should have learned these last two years. And then we will turn to a particular question for each participant. So, Mr. President, I'd like to begin with you for this brief round robin. What, did, what have we learned about Ukraine in the last two years? What should we have learned? So that's a polite way of asking what mistakes might we have made from which we could have learned? Mm -hmm. Please begin. Thank you very much. And I will start from the terminology because the horizon is something what is moving away when approaching. And uh, for Ukraine, I think we need very clear final uh, set goals and we have to be consistent in implementing those goals. I think there are uh, several channels how we can support Ukraine and uh, uh, I cannot imagine the success of Ukraine without one of those channels. First of all, I would start through, from military support. Of course, military support is a key issue. In order to be successful on the battlefield, we need to support Ukraine as soon as possible and as much as possible. Uh, much was done, uh, uh, a lot was done in the last uh, one and a half years and I think many Western countries changed their mindset, uh, just uh, started to realize that without massive uh, support with military equipment, it's not possible to keep Russian uh, pressure on Ukraine. And uh, I think uh, now uh, we need especially the uh, speed of implementation because decision, decisions are done, but the implementation, unfortunately, is too slow. And we are lagging behind of the needs of uh, Ukrainian soldiers. The second channel, which is also uh, as much important as the first one, is economic support and they count very much on uh, ability of my colleagues in European Council to take this very critically important decision on February 1st, when we uh, will gather in Brussels again in order to discuss the issue of 50 billion euros dedicated for macroeconomic finance, uh, macro, uh, finance um, assistance to Ukraine. And I hope uh, no matter 27 or 26 countries we will reach the agreement that it will, it, and, and it will be very material support to our friends Ukrainians. And the third channel is of course political support. Uh, we need uh, bold political decisions in order to be able to invite uh, Ukraine not on, only in uh, European Union and to start accession negotiations as soon as possible. But we also need success in the field of integration into NATO. And uh, I uh, would like to refer to Vilnius Summit. Uh, Lithuania, as you know, was proud uh, host of uh, this event. Uh, NATO Summit took place in July 11th and 12th in Vilnius. And I think it was very successful um, meeting, uh, not uh, only uh, because of uh, decisions which we are taken in the field of deterrence and defense, uh, for investment pledge, also regional plans, uh, defense plans, but also regarding Ukraine. Although the first reaction of our friends was not as optimistic as we expected, but uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, everybody understood that this is unique opportunity to make the first step and to expect that this strategic uh, possibility will be used in later summits. And uh, now we are uh, 
uh, counting last months before the Washington summit. And Mr. I President. hope that it will be the success too. Thank you. There'll be a second round of questions where we can Thank continue you. these themes. Sorry. Um, I want to just make sure that each of us has a chance for this impulse question. Impulse question. So Minister Olengun, let's take another shot at this. What ought we to have learned in the last two years that we can apply now? What have we learned about Ukraine? What have we learned about Europe? What have we learned about ourselves that we can apply going forward? I think what we've learned about Ukraine is its commitment to freedom and to democracy and to the European cause, uh, to NATO. Uh, I, see, I think we're seeing a, a country that's been in a full-scale war for two years, but in a war and the, the annexation of Crimea is 10 years ago now. Uh, so the commitment has only grown stronger, uh, and I think that's, that's what we've learned, that this is a real conviction that the Ukrainians have, but that they cannot do it alone. So they need our support, they need our military support, and they need our support to uh, connect uh, and to integrate with uh, Europe uh, as an economy. Uh, also in, their, in the security arrangements that we're talking about and that we're working on, uh, they, need, they need us, they need that commitment, uh, and we need to be there. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't talk about war fatigue, uh, and that we don't forget about Ukraine because we're occupied elsewhere in, in the world, war, war in, in, in the Middle East, uh, uh, threats in the Indo-Pacific, uh, the Balkan, uh, Africa. There are many things going on, but we need to continue that focus on Ukraine because Ukraine needs us, and I think that's what we've learned. Okay, well done. Um, Minister Alvarez Bueno, same question, same question to you. Um, we're very, it's one thing that strikes me in this discussion is how natural a group this is. It might not have seemed so natural a group three years ago before the war, and, and, but now there's a kind of natural collegiality of having a representative of the presidential staff of Ukraine, the, the plenipotentiary, if I may use that word, of the United States government for aid to Ukraine, the Minister of Defense of the Netherlands, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Spain, and the President of Lithuania together. This group has a kind of naturalness to it that it might not have had before the war. And that, for me, is one of the things that I have learned, that this constellation can actually emerge. And it's been something really heartening to see, especially from the other side of the Atlantic. Mr. Minister, same question. I, I think there are three main lessons. The first one is a little bit related to what you were saying, is that when we act within European Union, but also Europe with its natural allies, uh, especially the United States, when we act with unity and with solidarity, we achieve much better results and we do it much faster. The fact that very quickly we decided to provide weapons at the European Union level that we took and we aligned our sanction decision with, within European Union and with the United States, things like those made the difference. The, the second thing is that unfortunately we thought that European values and, and war in Europe as a way of settling disputes between the states was something that belonged to the past, something before World War II that it couldn't happen again. There are threats outside the uh, European Union. Russian aggression to Ukraine is one of them, also within our society that goes against democracy, against European values. And of course, war, it's still in the mind of some actors, a way of solving issues. And the third one is, and this is something that we should have done probably very quickly, we put a little bit of time in doing it, uh, we, we thought that it was very clear for everyone in the world that this was a war in Europe, that this, but this wasn't a European war, uh, because it affected very specific principles of the United Nations Charter. We should have talked much faster to the Global South to explain them that what is going on in Ukraine is not only about Europe, but it's about how we have a world order based on rules and the very basic principle of the United Nations Charter. Okay, that's so important that I want to follow up on it very briefly. Do you think, Mr. Minister, it is too late to do that? And if not, what ought Europeans to be doing? Because that seems to me to be a very important point you're making. Definitely not, and we have been doing it already for, for several months. But that, that's two things. One is to explain that what's at stake in Ukraine is not only uh, Ukraine's sovereignty and independence, which is already huge, but it's much more. And it doesn't matter in which continent you are, it affects you. If Russia wins this war, 
everyone in the world would be less safe because its big neighbor could want to do the same thing. And the second thing, we have to understand that there are side effects in this war that have strong impact on countries that are very far away from Ukraine. We have seen that with food supply, with the energy prices. And we must be next to those countries to help them. Spain, for instance, we have tripled our development cooperation programs on those issues with countries of Africa to tell them that we understand that for them there is also bad effects. Right. As a, as a historian of Ukraine, one thing which has struck me throughout this war is how difficult it has been for Ukrainians to explain to the global south that perhaps this is an imperial war, perhaps this is a colonial war. And I tend to think that if others can find ways to help them explain that, that would also be a good thing. Um, Secretary Pritzker, same question. What, ought, what might we have learned from the last two years that we can apply now going forward? Well, I think we've wasted too much time uh, in, I, in, to begin creating the enabling conditions for reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the area that I live in. And I would say that Ukraine is making consequential decisions now, not only to win the war, but also to win their future. And they're cognizant that they can't win this war in the absence of economic recovery. They're also cognizant that this is an economic war as much as it is. We've just talked about some of that. And I think the lesson for us is we've got to hold ourselves accountable uh, to our commitments to Ukraine and to accelerate our delivery on these commitments. And with the United States, I think we've made the commitment to have Ukraine's back and to help Ukraine stand on its own two feet. And it starts, obviously, with our uh, supplemental and our need to uh, get our own legislation completed. Um, I think with the private sector, it's, you know, my, my word is you need to go to Kiev. You need to go and see uh, what a, a European city looks like in the middle of Ukraine. And, uh, you know, just, and also understand the private sector mentality that exists the quality of the individuals who are uh, talent to run businesses to carry out reconstruction. Uh, and that the government is very much driven by, uh, they have a business mentality and a mindset. Uh, they hold themselves accountable to data, to key performance in indicators and things like that. Uh, and they're ready to prime the pump for projects. Um, and to the international community, I think the points that have been made here about we have to remain united and not get distracted. It's extremely important. Uh, the war, this war has enormous consequences for the world. And uh, if we, and none of, someone made the argument earlier today that I agree with, none of the big problems facing the world, uh, economic problems, things like uh, food security or things like inflation can't be solved without resolving this conflict. Beautiful. Mr. Yermak, same, same question. You have the last word, and then we'll turn to particular questions to particular participants. Thank you. I'd like to be very concrete and very short. Um, several conclusions and what we can learn during these two years. First of all, uh, for 100 percent understandable that any frozen conflict in some times uh, push to the new war. It means that all these uh, Minsk agreements, uh, this uh, lot of 100 rounds of the negotiations in Normandy formats, Russia use uh, to be prepared for the aggressions. Next, I think it's a time to forget that in our world can exist local war. The uh, aggressions Russia uh, uh, against Ukraine show and all the, uh, the uh, crisis which uh, uh, appeared in the results and uh, food crisis, environmental, humanitarian, that just the country in another continent have today influence of the war the biggest war in the Europe after the Second World War. Very important time. Everything it's necessary to do in time. We're very happy that several days ago, the first uh, 
security cooperation agreement that Great Britain was signed in Kyiv. This is the result of the declaration which was agreed in uh, Vilnius. But of course, it's necessary to understand if it's happened before, maybe we can prevent it, these uh, aggressions and these thousands of the people who is killed in Ukraine. Uh, the hacking of the international organizations, it's one of the strategy of the any aggressors. It means that we need very seriously to look because, for example, during these two years, any person from Red Cross, any time visited to the any prisoners of war of, uh, of Ukrainians who is in the terrible uh, conditions, they under tortures, and you can remember the uh, Alenivka prison, then Russians killed 50 persons uh, uh, of Ukrainian. And to last, uh, we really uh, saw that the mostly people of the world, uh, they very quickly made the choice and it's very good that the mostly the people of the world, ordinary people, make a very quickly choice that that on the side of the good, not on the side of the evil. It means that we more need politics of value than real politics. And the last, Russia never not stop war uh, by its will. It means that uh, to make it, Ukraine needs to win. And this is 100%. Thank you. That's, that's a very interesting point to, to, to end on. I wanted, I wanted to repeat Secretary Pritzker's point about existing conflicts being difficult to resolve without a Ukrainian victory. I would add to that the point that there are conflicts which haven't happened yet, which might well happen without Ukrainian victory. And so since you've asked an academic to moderate, which is, already, which is always a risk, I'm going to point out that Hannah Arendt in her Origins of Totalitarianism made the point that in order for such regimes to stop, they have to be defeated. Defeated not in arguments, but they have to be defeated in a way that they understand that they have been yeah. defeated. Um, that I, for me, that's something that the last two years have been a reminder of. We're now going to turn to uh, particular questions or particular participants, and I urge others to, to chime in if you like. Um, President Alceda, I'd, like I'd like to begin with you. Lithuania has been very clear, clearer than others, certainly clearer than my country, uh, about the need for a Ukrainian victory. Um, the slogan, whatever it takes, is much clearer than the slogan, uh, as long as it takes. My question to you is, what will it take and the slightly loaded part of my question is, can a war in Ukraine be won by Europe? Without United States? You may take that <laughs> as you will. No, I will start from the last uh, question. I cannot imagine that we could succeed without the engagement of United States. And this is very important because we are talking not only about the financial support, but we are talking about the chances or perspective of Ukraine towards uh, NATO. We are talking about the effectiveness of our sanctions. And uh, I, uh, for me, it's pretty clear that we can be effective only in the case we apply the same united policy of sanctions. We have the same approach regarding the how to behave uh, for, with the frozen assets of Russian Central Bank and private uh, frozen assets, and uh, regarding the accountability, accountability for the uh, crimes of aggression. So I think that United States, Europe, and other democratic countries, like-minded countries, have to uh, have the same approach, and only in that case we can proceed and we can achieve this victory. Uh, of course, much will depend on the braveness of uh, Ukrainian soldiers. But for my country, which is not a big country, for my country it was important to take the lead by example. We will not be the leaders by volume of the support because we are not a large country. 
but for my country it is important first of all uh, from the moral uh, point of view. We have 600 kilometers long border with Belarus. We have 120 kilometers long border with Kaliningrad region, actually uh, Russian Federation. So for my country, there were no illusions about the final intentions of Russian regime, uh, not in 2020, 2015, or 2022. My uh, country understands very well that the appetite of Russian regime is unlimited. And if they will succeed in Ukraine, there will be second target, the third target, and because they are challenging the entire democratic world, not concrete countries, not concrete targets, they are challenging our system, democratic system, the system which is based on the uh, uh, democratic principles and values. Mr. President, if I could follow up on, on one little point, because I want to make sure that, that, that others pick it up as well as, as if they like, especially given your background in finance and economics, frozen assets. Could you brief us on where that discussion currently stands? Well, we are uh, deep in the discussion what to do with the frozen assets and how co to create sustainable legal framework in order to make the system uh, work. So now we are talking about the generated incomes from immobilized Russian assets. And I hope very much that we will be able to uh, transfer these generated incomes to the fund which will be dedicated for the reconstruction of uh, Ukraine. But of course we are talking about uh, uh, the assets of Russian central bank reserves, the private assets which we have frozen by uh, applying the sanctions on Russia. And this is not so easy from the legal point of view uh, to, uh, to, to find the solutions. But even in this regard, as um, my colleague mentioned, we are too slow. And we were questioning, we were asking and uh, requesting um, the European Commission to try um, to prepare this legal framework. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, probably one year ago. But so far, we are not there. And I think this is very important that in many fields of our support to Ukraine, we speed up. Speeding up is very important in order to achieve uh, the better result. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Minister Olengren, I wanted to ask you about the connection between the European Union, its politics, and reconstruction. How, how can those two things be connected? How, does accession, how do accession and reconstruction work together? And how do we understand for ourselves and how do we explain the benefits of Ukrainian EU membership to, to Europeans? To yes, Europeans, to Europeans. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's a very, very fair point, a good point also. Um, well, I think uh, what I see in my country, for instance, is that there is really broad support for continuing support to Ukraine. Uh, and there is also a broad support for uh, starting uh, accession negotiations, talks, uh, and having, having that perspective for, uh, for Ukraine. Ukraine is seen much more now, perhaps, than before as a European country, as a neighboring country that belongs to Europe, that shares our values. Um, I'm not sure that people in the European Union are aware of the, uh, uh, the, the scale of the reconstruction that has to be done uh, in Ukraine. And that means also the scale of the damage done by Russia to Ukraine, especially, of course, in the annexed uh, regions still under Russian uh, control. Uh, but reconstruction is much more than that because Ukraine has been under attack. The whole country has been under attack. Uh, last winter, it was attacking the uh, vital infrastructure, the energy infrastructure. This year, they seem to be, or this winter, they seem to be targeting the, uh, the arms manufacturers and really military goals. But that means that there's been massive, massive um, uh, damage. Uh, and uh, I think we, we, we simply cannot sort of understand the scale of, of this. And Ukraine is also a very big country. Uh, we have many Ukrainians in the Netherlands and many other European countries. I, I'm sure that Ukraine wants them to come back. They can only come back if they have homes to come back to, if they have jobs to come back to. 
you will have hundreds of thousands of veterans to reintegrate into your society. So this reconstruction has so many aspects. Uh, and I think this is something that Europe and the European Union is really good at. Uh, to understand this, uh, to coordinate this, uh, to provide funding for this, and also to divide the work amongst ourselves, of course, under coordination of Ukraine itself. Mm -hmm. But it's huge. If I, if I can make another historian's point, one could perhaps recall that the European integration process at its origins was also a reconstruction process. Absolutely. That the yeah. physical reconstruction of Western and Southern Europe took place simultaneously with and was an integral part of the European Union, as we understand it today. With um, a little bit of help from the Americans. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Quite a lot. We're gonna, we're, we'll, let's keep that element in, yeah. let's keep that element very much, very much in play. And I, I also wanted to, to make the point, which I hope um, Secretary Pritzker will pick up as well, that the, the scale of reconstruction is also an opportunity. There are many things that we reconstructed, but that doesn't mean they're all gonna be built back exactly the way they were before. Many things can be built back um, better, to coin a phrase. Uh, and uh, many, many, many things can be, Ukrainians have ideas about how to reconstruct, which will be both interesting and profitable, I think. And so there, there, where there seems to be a greater scale of destruction, there is also, I think, sometimes a greater scale of opportunity. Minister Albat is going to essentially the same question. How do we link the politics of European Union accession with the process of reconstruction, broadly understood, and how, how should European politicians be talking to themselves and their constituents about the benefits of membership, of the Ukrainian membership in the European Union? Accession and reconstruction, actually, if we want to be successful for us, for European Union and for Ukraine, must be two parallel things. The, the, the challenge is huge. Minister was talking about that. The amount of money that will have to be invested, we have to realize that this is a country at war. It's such a challenge for Ukraine and for European Union that if we don't plan very well the reconstruction, uh, Ukraine will never be able to meet the criteria. Uh, and accession is already a very big spur for Ukraine to improve business environment, to do reforms, they are already making efforts to, uh, uh, with anti-corruption regulation, with lobby regulation. So both of them must be linked since the very beginning. And, and the benefits are very clear. For, for European Union, first of all, uh, we have to make sure, and I was saying this at the beginning, uh, that war is really eradicated from uh, Europe. If Russia wins this war, we, our security, will be at the stake, European Union security. So what's at the stake is to decide that European Union is the only one that decides who is a member of the club or not. That war is not a way of settling dispute between the states. So our security is really at the stake uh, on what will be going on at the end of the war uh, in Ukraine. And the second thing, is it's how we view ourselves as a project in the world. And Ukraine fits perfectly well, not only because the people in Ukraine are also fighting for our own values and for being with us, but it's also how we will relate to the rest of Europe and to the rest of the world. And therefore, we need Ukraine in our project. Mm -hmm. if, I could, if I could just follow up on that, I, it's... Um, it, we often forget that the, the European Union, even as it was a project of reconstruction, it was also a project that involved countries, some of them represented here, losing imperial wars and finding their way back to Europe. And, and I can't help but think that the lesson that a country has to lose a war could be more clearly stated when we speak about the European Union. That is to say, the Russian, it's not just that Ukraine has to win, it's that Russia has to lose. And those are both independently good things, I believe. Um, Secretary Pritzker, I, I, I hope you will pick up on some of the points that have already come up. Um, if, you could, if you could brief us from your point of view on the question of frozen assets, that would be very helpful. But what I'd particularly be interested in hearing from you about are, is what is special about this challenge of reconstruction. 
Re Reconstruction is, is, now, is now your brief, and you have all sorts of experience in American government and the private sector, which is relevant to this, to this brief. What would you say is special about this Reconstruction challenge in Ukraine? Uh, for me, as someone who has been traveling around the country during the war and has physically watched people rebuild their houses, it, it, stri it strikes me that an important element of this has to be um, while we focus on the central government, we also find the localities or the other actors who have proven themselves successful in helping to, re in helping to rebuild. This could be the private sector, this could be civil society, this could be local government. But I'd like to ask you to reflect on the breadth of what a reconstruction effort would look like in Ukraine. Thanks. Well, let me start at the first question and then evolve to the second mm -hmm. question. There are many things that are special about this reconstruction. First of all, it's the largest reconstruction project since World War II. And unlike other reconstruction projects, let's say in Afghanistan or Iraq, you have a highly, you have a combination of things. A highly skilled workforce, a strong state capacity, a willing population, and a long-term pathway into the EU and NATO. And that combination is extremely powerful when it comes to reconstruction. Then you add on top of it the world's richest soil that's capable of feeding the world and inexpensive IT specialization. And you add those capabilities, you add all those qualities together, that makes this a particularly uh, compelling situation. The challenge, of course, is it's in, we're in the middle of a war. So we've got to deal, of course, with the first situation before we can deal with the f past, but we don't have to wait. The situation in Ukraine, the way I think about it, and it's because I'm a runner, I think about it as a sprint and a marathon. And, um, you know, the goal is a long-term, uh, sustainable, digital, clean, uh, competitive European uh, Ukraine integrated into global markets. That's the marathon. But there's a lot of things that we can do now in the sprint, if you will. And, the, and those are the things that, uh, the, that the Ukrainian government and my part of our engagement were working on very actively. And that's working together to accelerate reforms. Obviously, there's lots to do there. Support the development of key infrastructure that's absolutely necessary for Ukraine to take advantage of its uh, uh, expertise and capabilities as well as its natural resources. So to improve, for example, the ability to export um, items. To unlock new tools, whether those tools are things like war risk insurance or maritime insurance, but also tools like uh, the Ukrainian government is, I think, the best e-government system in the world that I've seen. I think surpassing Estonia and uh, their population is using their services, the capacity to take what are national services and bring them to the local level I think is huge potential and frankly uh, some of us in the Western world could learn a lot from those systems and frankly I wish my DMV ran like your DMV uh, if you will. Um, but also uh, uh, there's the, an effort to reintegrate veterans and re refugees is absolutely essential. And then finally, on, on the sprint, if you will, um, this notion of Russia must pay. And doing the work now among the G7 countries, among the relevant parties who have assets, uh, Russian sovereign assets, it's important to do that work now. It's hard, it's complicated, it's difficult, and we need to work, you know, get all the lawyers and all the various governments and all the parties really to come together to sort that through. Um, and then I think the marathon and the opportunity, there are six, um, you know, there are a number of sectors in Ukraine that are obvious sources of opportunity, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in the defense industry, whether it's in critical minerals and mining, whether it's in energy, transportation and logistics, uh, uh, or, t or their IT and tech sector. You don't have to work very hard for those sectors to really become soaring opportunities. So I think this um, notion of 
uh, reconstruction has many dimensions to it and many things we can focus on now. Now, Tim, I know you focused on, um, and you were telling me about the tiny NGOs that are doing work today. You know, I think there's a huge uh, thing to focus on that's going on that also makes Ukraine's reconstruction very special. There is a local and individual efforts that are going on that are incredibly impressive. And uh, whether it's SMEs, whether it's local authorities, whether it's tiny NGOs that are doing work, and that ingenuity, that creativity, that it's, it's not just happening on the battlefield, it's also happening in reconstruction. And that's, those, are, those are capabilities that need to be built upon. So on, on that human question, before we get to Mr. Yermak, who's going to have the last word, I, I wanted to, to ask European colleagues as, to reflect on something which Mr. Yermak already mentioned, by the way, which is the human element. So for me, the, the question, what have we learned in the last two years, I think one of the things that a lot of us have learned was there are quite a, quite a large number of quite extraordinary Ukrainians in quite a number of fields which I don't think we really, I mean, in fairness, I think it, very few of us appreciated that, whether it's from, you know, from the battlefield to the academy. Um, there, there, there are so many capable Ukrainians across so many professions and so many disciplines, so many walks of life, but millions of them are now not in Ukraine. Millions of them are now in European Union countries, and very often it's those particular people who Ukraine needs to have come back. And it's not just an economic question, it's also, a, it's also a question, I mean, if you'll forgive the word, it's also a question of genocide. Because if Russia's war aim is to make the Ukrainian population as small and as little Ukrainian and as dispersed as possible, millions of Ukrainians leaving the country and not coming back is also a military and, so to speak, a moral victory for Russia. So I'm wondering if any thought has been given to the question of how, I mean, it, it, obviously these are complicated processes involving families and children and so on. But it seems to me that with reconstruction must come probably some formal explicit mechanisms which incentivize people or help people to make that transition back to Ukraine. I don't think it's going to happen on its own. And so I just wanted to briefly ask European colleagues if thought has been given to that. Not really. I mean, there is no this reflection yet in Europe because we are very much focused on, on the very urgent needs of the war and giving protection to the people. But I, I think that if the war doesn't go forever, let's say, if it's within a certain scope of time, Ukrainians will uh, prefer and will rather that experience of the ones that we have in Spain, almost 200,000, they want to go back to their country if they have the choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There will be certain motivation anyway to, to come back to Ukraine after the war and I think that the reconstruction of Ukraine and especially this policy to build back better I think will uh, have uh, give the, a lot of opportunities to young people. And I just can only can uh, support uh, and confirm what you said regarding that talents of Ukrainian people because we have about 50,000 Ukrainians in Lithuania and I noticed that many of them learned Lithuanian language which is, which is, which is pretty uh, complicated <laughs> in six, seven months. Mm -hmm. And it was not the case uh, as uh, during the Soviet times with Russian population. They could not uh, learn Lithuanian language in 30 years. So probably it's not only the matter of talent, of course, this is a matter of uh, motivation. But I think that uh, having in mind that uh, it will be the country of opportunity after the war uh, finish, I think there will be, uh, of course, uh, motivation to come back. But of course, the labor market and all the environment and legal framework should be prepared for return of Ukrainian people. I and I am believer that uh, the future of Ukraine is bright. Yeah. I, taking all those points, I, I can't help but think that when the time comes, of course the time is not yet, but when the time comes, it may help to have a formal mechanism at the EU level just to give people a way to do it, a, t a timing and perhaps an, an, an incentive. Because from the point of view of individual member states, I mean, turning what some of you have said a slightly different way, it is awfully useful to have lots of Ukrainians in your country. Poland, for example, runs almost 
I'm looking for polls in the audience, runs almost entirely on Ukrainians at, at this point, right? So it's, 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 a, it's very easy. I, I now notice two is Polish in the crowd when I say that. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's very easy to take this excellence and make it your own um, and uh, without really noticing this has happened. Okay, I've made my point and I've left the last five minutes for Mr. Yermak, whose, whose question is a very broad one. What must change in geopolitics for this war to come to the kind of end to which it should come? And what, was, what must we be careful to preserve in Ukrainian politics and society so that that victory will be meaningful? These are broad questions, and please feel free to pick up on whatever points were raised along the way. Thank you very much. I, in beginning, uh, I'd like to make some uh, short reactions. You ask uh, for our European friends, as we also Europeans, I, I a little bit add <laughs> that. Uh, Good remark. Um, you know, very concretely, if now we will receive additional air defense to our country, which were discussed uh, in each meetings and the presidents, the, the leaders uh, of the country and the level of the ministers, our people will continue to back. And of course, uh, you know, this war, one of these uh, uh, lessons of, the, of many Ukrainians, that the best to live in the country in which you born. And maybe when the millions have to go in the beginning of this invasion, maybe before they don't so deeply understand how they love country and that the biggest chances they have in Ukraine. In the same time, I'd like to start to answer to your uh, questions uh, for say, very big grateful for all our friends, partners, uh, for everything which done and in doing uh, to help to, uh, to support Ukraine. Uh, and now, you know, that Franklin Roosevelt some many years ago said that uh, the world peace, it uh, can't be the work of one man, one party, of one country. It means that the most important that this unity, uh, absolutely uh, a historical unity of the world, of the democratic free world around Ukraine, Ukraine will be continued. And of course, uh, uh, we need this help. We need this help in time. And thank you for friends and colleagues that they are deeply understand that uh, during these two years, just during the last years, we showed that we able not just to defend, we able to win. And I'd like to uh, repeat that just during this period of time, practically more than 60, 600 uh, days of these invasions, we already occupied 50 more than 50% of our territory. We practically, uh, uh, destroyed any dominations of the Russian fleets in the Black Sea. Against the many conversations, we opened new corridors of the, uh, of the grains, which successfully work. We not go for the, any compromise for the blackmails from the Russian side. Of course, it's this unity of our partners and friends. The same time, for us, it's a very important, and this is the one of the priority of the President Zelensky, to keep the unity internal in country. Because uh, this is uh, one of the, our very strong uh, arguments and very strong uh, uh, weapons in this war. Um, and of course, uh, I think that it's necessary after these two years the Ukrainians' fightings uh, and the brave bravery of Ukrainian people show very important, I think, for many, many years, things that it's possible in our world uh, be really independent. It's possible not afraid. It's possible to defend your values, your principles. And now it's necessary to finish this job. 
and we are ready to do it. We are really uh, have the all uh, possibility. Our people not tired. Yes, two years, it's a lot of times, but we still very high motivated because we fighting for our land. And uh, you know, the uh, support of the world, which I saw the two days ago uh, during the very successful meetings here, thank you, Switzerland, uh, of the uh, National Security Advisors, in which presents 82 countries, it's one more confirmation. And this is first uh, meetings. We started from a uh, little bit more than 20 countries. Now it was uh, practically the numbers of the uh, Security Council. Uh, and it's from uh, any uh, continents. I think we need to be together. We need to believe, not hesitate, believe continue support, and I absolutely confident, I'm sure, that Ukraine will win, and it will be a common victory of all independent, all free world, and, for, and uh, make a very clear signal. Democracy win, will win against uh, uh, di uh, dictators. It's kind of you, Mr. Yermak, to, to remember to, to thank partners. And, and, it's, and we appreciate, of course, that you say that, but I want to end by just noting that we actually owe you much more than you owe us, and it's really incumbent upon us to thank you for doing all the things that we wouldn't be able to do without you, and that's the note on which I'd like to close. Thank you very much, all participants, for, for taking part. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.